Hello, everybody. The internet, it can be a beautiful thing. It's brought all of us together here today. And our little corner of the craft beer internet world brought us together in a specific CBP thread about a brewery that has the counter service model. Now, the original poster wrote, I've trained my staff and encouraged them to walk the floor when it's not busy and to offer another round to my customers with empty glasses. I'm starting to get pushback from some staff saying it gives the impression we're table service and it's setting an expectation that staff will always do this. All of you here today engaged in that thread. And today we're going to dive deep into guest expectations and how to not only set, but exceed them. But first introductions and Nick, because you are to the right of me, you get to go first. Hi, I am Nick Rainey. I'm the Tapper Manager of Triptych Brewing in Savoy, Illinois. Nick, glad you're here today. Tiara, you're up. Hello, I'm Tiara Austin uh, at Walking Stick Brewing Company in Houston, Texas, and I'm the General Manager. You joined us a while back. Good to see you again. Casey, you and I were in a panel face-to-face -face a few years ago, so it's nice to have you virtually. <laughs> and you're on mute. Well, we're going to work on that today. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. They actually named a beer called Casey. You're on mute. So um, <laughs> that's for for good reason, yeah. apparently. So um, yeah, I'm Casey at Four Noses Brewing. Um, we also have Wild Provisions Beer Project in Boulder, Colorado, and Odd 13 Brewing in Lafayette, Colorado. And I am the front of house and HR director for those three brands. I'm sure you stay very busy. I have a good team. They do a good job for me. So love it. Jim, your turn. Hey, I'm Jim Christian. I'm the taproom manager and events coordinator here at Savannah River Brewing Company in Augusta, Georgia. Awesome. Thanks again for being here again, Jim. And Erica, last but not least. Hi, I'm Erica Baca. I'm co-owner of Coal Mine Avenue Brewing Company in Littleton, Colorado. Awesome. Well, Erica, great to have you. Now, first question, we're going to start off really basic. You know, that thread we were talking about was talking about setting guest expectations. Why did all of you feel the need to comment on that thread? And why is setting guest expectations important to you? I'll go first. Go um, we had a very specific <laughs> vision for what we wanted our brewery to be. Um, we picked being out in suburbia uh, where there were no other breweries for a reason because um, we wanted to introduce new people to the experience we had discovering craft beer. And we've been to places that did that well and places that didn't do it so well. So we wanted to make sure that we were one of those places that did it the way we thought was the right way to do it. Um, and that's creating an environment where everybody feels welcome, um, that everybody has a, a spot and everybody has, you know, something that they can enjoy about the space. Erica, what's an example of a place you've been into over time that really didn't feel that way or didn't set guest expectations well? Um, they're no longer around, but we don't, this is actually part of my notes that I have for today is we don't name drop. Um, oh, yeah, example. sorry, I wasn't asking your name. So, uh, yeah, no, there was there was a place where we were we were one of maybe three or four tables. We were actually seated at the bar, so we were one of maybe three or four groups. And um, the beer tender had some friends or some regulars in house, and he just didn't want to be bothered with anyone but them. So it was kind of an unfortunate experience because we, you know, we didn't want to monopolize that server's time, but we certainly wanted to kind of explore what they had to offer and taste some stuff. And, you know, we, we enjoy interacting not just with each other when we go out to these places, but with the staff and the people that we, we think are as passionate as we are about craft beer. And it was kind of disappointing to find that, that that wasn't necessarily the case. That's unfortunate. I imagine you would have spent a little bit more money too. Probably, yeah. Jim, you're up. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Erica said, I've been in lots of uh, breweries where walking in, uh, it's kind of confusing what to do. And I've been to many, many, many breweries. And so we here in Augusta are a very transient town. Uh, one of the things that we struggle with is with the medical community. We have three colleges and uh, Fort Gordon, so a huge military presence. We have new people here all the time. So we always have to kind of stay on our toes. Uh, we have a lot of regulars, but new people all the time. So making it very simple where people understand exactly what to do when they walk in. I feel like it's not confusing. We're a tap room. We're essentially a bar. We don't have food service. It makes it pretty simple. Uh, but I don't want to ever be under the impression that people should know what to do. So we have signage about exactly how to order, where to order, uh, very well-trained, uh, very engaged staff who treats people really well, uh, treats people equally all the time. So uh, one of the things in that thread um, about the counter service versus table service, 
the thing that I kind of pushed back on was the occasional table service, right? So people who you know, or people who are kind of struggling, offering those folks uh, the opportunity to bring them a beer at their table. Uh, I think that's cool, but what happens is the table next to them sees it and expects it. So treating people, everybody the same, the regulars and first timers, everybody gets the same treatment. It's yeah, I agree with you. Go ahead, Erica. Problem. So we, we do table service. We switched to that model about six months before the pandemic hit um, at the request of our taproom manager just to give it a try. Um, so we're a bigger place. We see it about two now. So um, they, the servers were wondering how much more tip money they could make if they were bringing beers to people. Um, and we just, we saw double digit growth in our sales just from doing table service over the first couple months. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if you're in the middle of a conversation with your, with your group at your table, you probably don't want to get up and order another beer, but if I'm going to bring it to you, you'll buy it. So that, our opposite problem of that was if someone's standing at the bar thinking they have to order there, now we have a line at the bar and now our servers are out at the table and the people are at the bar trying to order and the people at the table are ordering for them. And it's just, it's kind of chaos that way. So like it's that, that's a, that's a problem from both sides. Erica, when people walk into your tap room, do they know what the ordering experience is going to be like? Are they aware that they can order at both the counter and the tables? And how do you make them aware of that? We have a big marker board that's right inside the front door. Um, it's three feet by four feet, I believe, and nobody reads it. <laughs> nobody no reads it. Read. No. Well, I guess, you know, to follow up with that, you know, how do you make them aware of the ways they can be served? We usually just greet them and say, hey, grab a seat. We'll be right with you. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. I was going to dive deeper into the fact that you are table service, and it's great to hear some of those, you know, strategies you've used so far and the benefits you're seeing. Yeah. Everybody else, you know, why is setting guest expectations so important to you? Keeps people coming back. Um, hey, keep going, Nick. Yeah, you know, I think people oh, can okay. I wasn't sure. Oh, go ahead, Sometimes Nick. we're bouncing around, but it keeps people coming back. It kind of builds your space as um, kind of gives it that neighborhood bar kind of vibe or like a cheers kind of feel like at least here, like if you're building relations like here and everywhere, if you're building relationships with people, like they're not, they, they are coming to have a drink and unwind from the day or whatever, or try new things. But if they feel welcomed there, I mean, and they're going to keep coming. And what's the ordering experience like in your tap room? Uh, so we are just bar service, but we'll float around occasionally. And if there, if we don't have a line at both ordering stations at the bar, we'll float around, chit chat with people and, oh, your beer is almost empty. Do you want another one? And then we'll add it onto the tab. Um, I'm really big on trying to get, um, so we're, we're a pretty small space here. We can seat about a hundred, 110 people indoors. And then we have a small patio as well, but, um, our tap room servers, uh, there are three of us plus myself, uh, try to get everyone to try to remember regulars' names pretty quickly. And it really helps when you're swiping their credit card and they actually open a tab and they're not just a guy who pays cash every time that orders that one beer. Um, but just trying to get people really familiar and like make it a communal space that um, a lot of folks want to be at. You mentioned that from time to time when it's slower, you might have your staff check on guests at the tables and, you know, give them a new beer. You know, have yeah. you found any negative consequences from that? Like if someone comes on a slow Tuesday, you refill fill their beer on a Friday night, they're expecting the same level of service. Have you ever run into that? Uh, not here, no. Um, I've found that at a previous place that I uh, worked at was a somewhat similar environment with a full bar. And that we had a lot of problems with, but here, just because it's such a confined space and if I'm standing at the bar, I can see everyone in the room if I turn my head 50 degrees. So I think people kind of understand that if they see a line of people at both ordering stations, that we're probably not going to make it out to their table right away, but more than likely they'll just get up and order another beer. Fair enough. Casey, how about you? What are, what are your thoughts on just creating these expectations? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, customers are so well trained through all the different experiences that we have when we when we go around to the, throughout the world. We we know how a restaurant typically works, and we know how a fast casual restaurant typically works, and we know how fast food works, and um, how a tap room that doesn't 
necessarily offer food, how that experience works. And so um, I find one of the hardest things you can do is to retrain a customer uh, to walk in and hyper, start hybridizing models. Or um, There's a number of places around that are doing, you order your first one here, you sit down and now you have a server and there's a, you can be pick up your food at this window and the server, you know, it's very, it gets confusing. And um, those models are all with great intention and probably work really well when everyone's on the same page. Uh, but um, trying to tra retrain every customer, that's a huge challenge. And can, uh, th I think people believe a good value is when their expectations are exceeded. It doesn't mean your beer was cheap. It doesn't mean your product was sold at a just have a good value product does not mean it needs to be sold at a low price. It just means to mean their expectations were met or exceeded. So when I walk into a, any business and I have a certain idea for how it's going to go, if it goes as good or better and the beer is great and the service was good and it all went, then I'm very happy with that experience. And I'm not upset that, um, you know, that maybe someone didn't come to my table or kind of, or something like that. But then when someone does and then I have a really, um, positive experience with an employee that's what takes it to the next level is um maybe you have that, that extra interaction whether that's someone at your table maybe they didn't even bring you a beer maybe they were just busting tables and asked you how your day was going and asked you what your favorite beer on your flight was um what you're doing in town all those questions so um i think that's where you now create a good value and you'll have guests coming back yeah those little touch points they really go a long way your I turn. think whether or not you can, or if you don't mind, um, yeah, go for it. I think whether or not you can, uh, whether or not you can hybridize, or you know how much you can run those extra beers to tables, will depend on your brewery in particular. Uh, how how busy are you, and how big is it? You know, we talk about large square foot footprints. If you're running, if you're going to run a hundred yards to deliver a beer, maybe not the best use of anybody's time. Um, and if your place is packed and standing room only, and the people are mingling around, moving everywhere, you're Maybe your best use of your staff is to just shuffle out beers over the bar as quickly as possible, you know? So I don't think uh, any one model is best for any particular group. We call that panic mode. Because <laughs> when we're busy, we usually have one person, usually me, pouring beers. And then I have servers that have sections. And so those are bringing in and I'm pouring them and then they come. And if you're not busy, you grab someone else's beers and drop them. But yeah, there's times where it just goes off the rail and we're all just behind the bar just helping who we can. Erica, how big is your tap room? Uh, we're 4,500 square feet inside, and then we have about 5,000 square feet outside with the dog park and then the leash dog patio. So you're a little bit bigger than Nick's space, it sounds like. Yeah, it's like all together, it's like 14,000 square feet inside and out. And approximately how many people can fit inside? Our, our legal capacity is 454, but we have wow. seating for right at 200. Yeah, we're so setting there. expectations are extremely important to you, especially when you have a packed house. They need to yeah. understand what's going to happen. Yeah. And tonight we have a theme trivia. So we'll be packed in about half an hour. We'll have 150, 180 people arrive for trivia. And because I'm curious, what's the theme tonight? Colorado. Oh, Nature, cool. sports, landmarks, etc. Hmm. Tiara, your turn. Um. So I wanted to backtrack a little on the experiences that some of you guys have had at other breweries. Um, just last weekend, we were in Austin uh, for uh, the Texas Craft Brewers Guild, and we uh, decided to go have brunch at a brewery. Um, and knowing that they didn't open until 11 a.m., you know, uh, me and my head brewer just kind of lingered in the parking lot and I mean, I know how it feels whenever we're trying to open and, and customers are trying to come in and it's it's not always fun. You're not always very pleasant whenever someone's right at the door at 1059. Um, but I'm mindful of that. They don't know who I am. And so walking into said brewery, um, our immediate, I guess, greeting was, hey, we don't open until 11 with some sass and <clears throat> little does that person know I was coming to meet her general manager and director of operations. So it was, it's kind of interesting whenever you just never know who you're talking to, um, who you're addressing, who's visiting that day. So <clears throat> it was kind of comical. You know, I didn't say anything. We politely just said, Oh, no problem. We're just looking at the merchandise. Like I'm not trying, I'm not standing at the bar trying to rush you because I know you're not technically open yet. Um, so then, 
yeah, that was just something interesting to, to see. And that's another reason why you have to be so consistent. You have to be kind. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you woke up late and you're grumpy and you haven't had your coffee yet. When you're at the brewery or you're opening up your tap room, you just have to be aware. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Um, obviously, I did not. I chose not to tell uh, my friend about her employee um, because she could kind of see it pan out when her boss came and sat down with us. So um, I think I think she kind of she got it. <laughs> so it was interesting. I love this conversation already because there's been so many mentions of just consistency, building relationships, removing confusion. You know, we've talked big picture so far. But if you know, if I was to walk into each of your tap rooms, what's one thing you do in your space that is designed to you know help set those expectations? Is there any one thing you do, whether it's a sign, a greeting, you know, how do you help start and set those initial expectations for a new guest? We just really greet everybody as they walk in. Yeah, greeting for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people don't read signs, so it's all it. If they're not walking in and heading straight to a table, it's like, hey, come on in, grab a seat. We'll be right with you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Something that's interesting here. So we have a really pretty Scrabble board menu um, that's on our tap wall. And everyone likes to walk straight to the wall. Um, but we actually do our ordering from the other side. Um, we have bar mats. We have floor mats. We have menus. We have a sign on the corner of the bar that says order here. But because everyone sees this giant board menu, they go straight to it and we're like, hey guys, we've got more descriptive and detailed menus at the end of the bar where you can order. And we've got little signs that say, please order at the end of the bar. But it's, I kind of like the challenge to have my staff speak up um, when, as soon as they see someone start walking to the wall, we all know, we all laugh, but it it's nice to see everyone kind of step up and know um, to be vocal and, and direct them. We had a similar actual challenge with real big, pretty chalk signs and um, people, you know, not enough room to have a lot of information about what the beer is, you know, um, maybe it says hazy IPA, something like that, what hops are in it. Um, but people would order based on how pretty the chalk art was or, you know, and they'd sit there and ask a lot of questions. What, what's in it? What, what about it? What kind of Saison is it? What kind of, out is it um is it dry is it sweet uh, and so when covid came we weren't allowed to have people inside and so i took down the signs no one could look at them and i just never brought them back and we uh, have these every every menu is a paper menu with a detailed description and now i have the expect as a customer i'm not going off of artwork i have a detailed description and so i my, I've now set expectations. I know what this beer is going to taste like, more or less. I have a, and and to your point, our chalk signs were on the opposite end of where we'd prefer people to order. So it wasn't uh, doing us any favors. But I tried taking them away pre-COVID once, and uh, the customers rioted, so they were not happy. So, but in that way, it was a good a good thing for me. So Casey, I absolutely love having physical menus, and you know, you you talk a lot about removing com confusion from the experience. What types of benefits besides your guests being a little more educated have you seen from physical menus? Have you seen the higher tabs, just a smoother ordering experience? What benefits have you experienced? And now's a good time if you're drinking a sure. case of uh, your I'd own. I'd like to say. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Um, I'd like to think it increased our to-go sales um, because the big chalk menu does not didn't have our, ours at least did not have to go options on it. So, um, the, they're one there, we have our display fridge by where we like people to order. And then also, um, on that same menu has your to go options. Uh, but we've been doing, we've had the paper menu in addition to chalk menus since, since that was, you know, that was one of the first things I did eight years ago. So, um, I can't say for sure what the immediate change was, but, um, I think just giving your guests all the information, what their non-alcoholic options are, what your Wi-Fi password is, Kind of have it all in one space and have one place they can look. Um, people like being able to find information without asking. Um, if they have to ask, great, I'm more than happy to help you and I can help you with whatever questions you have. But uh, um, a lot of people just want to be able to find what they need quickly and they expect a menu is going to have that for them. No, I love that. 
So before the pandemic, we went from not having any menus whatsoever. We have a, a chalk description of all the beers, uh, minimally descriptive uh, names and styles and ABV, but not everyone knows what a 60 shilling is or a Belgian double. And so we, uh, before the pandemic, went to paper menus and people loved it. We cut it out during the pandemic and went to QR codes and saw a lot of uh, fall off and people actually using them. Most people t tend to not like them a whole lot, I find. And so it was a lot of, uh, so one of the biggest things that I find is the customer experience, no matter if you're doing table service or bar service, it's all about efficiency. No one wants to wait for their beers. Uh, we had a big event, our sixth anniversary on Saturday. Uh, we have the same space as Erica does apparently, 4,500 square feet with 200 seats inside, another 100 outside. And we poured, I think, nine and a half barrels uh, during that day. And uh, looking at my little watch and, you know, monitoring the service all day, no one really waited more than a couple of minutes for a beer all day long. So efficiency of service is the whole thing. And if you don't, so what we found is we went back to paper menus um, probably six months ago. And it cut, not that we don't like having conversations at the bar, you know, tell me about this beer. We love those conversations. Obviously, on a huge Saturday, uh, no one wants that person taking five minutes to order beer at the front of the bar. So the paper menus definitely help. We have them out front. We have them on the bar ready for people when they get here. Uh, so it does, no doubt about it, speed up service. Um, good descriptions are great. Uh, it helps people make decisions really easily. Um, and I think that's all I was going to say about that. <laughs> now, Jim and Casey, you know, I think one of the negative things we hear people complain about for paper menus is having to print them all the time. You know, yeah, sure. do you find yourself printing lots of menus or is there some sort of hybrid you do to, you know, eliminate somewhat of that problem? We still have the QR menus. Uh, we encourage folks to reuse them as much as possible. So we're not just throwing them away all the time. Um, as we kick beers and put new beers on, I do find myself reprinting stuff all the time. But for the most part, it's not a huge deal for me. I don't know. It kills trees, but, you know. Yeah, we, um, we packaged over 100 SKUs last year with this one brewery alone. So um, we print menus way too often, if I'm being honest. Um, but that, I mean, that furthers why I want the menus. We have so many things, uh, 20 beers on at once, but a hundred packaged beers a year, it's a, it's a lot. And so can as much way I communicate the information as possible, but, um, kind of tricky to not print, you know, sure. for us to not have them. And yeah, I probably print them two or three times a week. I definitely appreciate the value of a paper menu and, you know, perhaps even just having your flagship listed on the menu and a QR code that says scan here to see rotating options or something like that to maybe save a few more trees. Yeah, I just yeah, had a comment from Jake saying that uh, paper menus are cool, but uh, a pet peeve is when we're out of a beer and it's still in the menu. Um, people want to order that beer that's not available. So what we do is as soon as a beer kicks, we go through all the printed menus and just kind of X out that one that's gone before we print some new stuff up. I'm not envious of the person who has to do that task. <laughs> we actually bought these uh, reusable stickers and now we don't really do paper right, menus, yeah. but you guys are talking me into it again. But <laughs> we, um, so we put our menus in the little plastic sleeves. Um, and so we have these reusable stickers that say kicked or unleashing soon. Cause when we, when we tap a new beer, we call it unleashing. So we have an off leash dog park at our place. So everything's kind of <laughs> tied to that. So um, we, we'll put that sticker on the little plastic sleeve and then pull it off when that beer is ready to be served. Or if we kick one, it's easy just to go through and do that. And then we're not having to, I don't know what's what it, it kind of looks cool, but people also do peel them off and then say, well, your menu says that you have this sticker on. It's like, well, cause you pulled the sticker off. Doesn't mean we have it, <laughs> but yeah, it's been a struggle with, with, not having the physical menus i've come, been kind of thinking because we don't have a physical display board at all so we're we're just qr code um right now we do have tablets that we use at the bar to ring in like orders from the bar staff and in addition to the handheld pos units our servers hold but um what we'll do for that is if people don't want to or can't pull it up on their phone we'll just pull it up on one of those tablets and let them look at it on there but i think you guys talked to me into getting physical menus again I mean, I think a few years ago, you'd go to a brewery, you'd have one type of menu, that big menu on a wall. Now I think the ordering experience consists of like 10 billion different kinds of menus, the QR code, the paper menu, the chalkboard menu, the, you know, the TV menu. There's so many different options out there right now. And, you know, people yeah. all have different expectations. It's a matter of owning what works best for you. Right. Yeah. The last place we went to had this. It's like, well, we're not that place. Yeah. That's one thing that baffles me constantly is 
that people go to a new place. So we're going to go check out this new craft brewery, but they don't want to try anything new. They don't want, they want the same experience. They want the same atmosphere. They want the same beers at like the, at their last place that they usually go to. I just, I, I, I kind of wonder why they're out to try something new and what we're missing with that. Interesting point there. Yeah. Nick and Tiari, what's one thing you do to help set those guest expectations from the get go? Uh, well, one thing we did, uh, it's been kind of summer of 2020 when we were able to reopen our patio uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we changed the pay structure for everybody in uh, the tap room. Uh, so we eliminate the pre-pandemic uh, triptych had probably nine part-time bartenders and a tap room manager that was full-time. And we loved all those folks, but they all had other jobs. And uh, when we had to let everybody go, um, it kind of gave us a little bit of perspective to step back and uh, kind of think, well, what's the best way to like, make people feel valued as employees here. And for us, that was um, changing the pay structure. So I've got three full-time bartenders and everyone makes a living wage, works full-time hours. And it also kind of eliminated that, uh, that invisible barrier that we all have um, with uh, guests where it's like, oh, I'm just being fake nice to you so I can get that dollar out of you after I pour your domestic lager that you want or what have you when that goes away like you can just actually enjoy yourself you can you're talking people talking to people genuinely partly because it is your job but also just partly to just work on building better relationships with people I know that there were a lot of people um here that um like guess wise there were a lot of folks that were not great tippers prior to the pandemic and um a couple of people uh, that used to work here would come in and sit at the bar and they like they'd see that person roll walk in and they don't even work here any, any, anymore and they would roll their eyes like oh that guy's here he doesn't tip I'm like well we don't do that here anymore so i don't know why you're still upset about it but it doing something like that like if you can afford to do it that really kind of made a lot of our guests happier. Um, a lot of people are really weirded out by it too, because tipping is so ingrained in American service industry culture, but I think it really helped us out a lot. So to clarify, Nick, you don't have tipping in your tap room. Correct. So how do you make guests aware of that? Because I mean, I think we're also, as you mentioned, ingrained, we go out, we get served, we tip at most places we go. So, you know, how do you handle that when a guest goes to do it or do you make them aware of it prior? So we have uh, little signs that are like four by six cards that are up by our uh, both of our ordering stations. Um, so we use squares of POS and previously you'd flip the iPad around, they would pick a percentage and sign. We completely like removed the tipping option on the uh, iPad. So once we run their card, it's just like, thanks, do you want a receipt? But uh, we have a lot of people that um, still feel inclined to leave money behind for good service. Uh, so we have, uh, we'll have a little jar that, or a pint glass or what have you. And uh, any money that gets left behind gets split. Uh, it all gets pooled. And then quarterly we do, uh, we donate about half, if not more of it to charity. And then the rest of it goes into like a staff fund of sorts. And so if we've got, someone who like burned all their vacation days or sick days or what have you and then they get COVID again and they have to miss work for a week i had a bartender that that happened to uh later last year and we were able to give her her full week's worth of pay out of that um a couple years ago we closed the tap room for a day and we went down to a baseball game and went to a bunch of breweries and things like that so it's just Nice to have like a little nest egg for the staff or if something like that happens. And it makes them feel more appreciated too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I like that. Now, Tiara, you know, what's one thing you do to help set these guest expectations for when they walk in? Can you hear me? Okay. There's my neighbors have a generator running. I cannot hear the generator. Okay, cool. It's another brewery too. I'm not going to call them out. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to go back to uh, the menus. Um, so we've been open four years. And I guess 
four years ago, we decided to make these fancy menus with um, like little glasses that kind of mirror what the beer looks like, whether it's in a tulip or a pint glass and like the color. Um, <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time making that. And then every time we added more beers, you know, we'd have to draft up this little uh, image um, to represent the, the beer. But <clears throat> as of maybe five months ago, my tapper manager um, just wanted to do away with it because the original creator of that menu is not here anymore. So it was kind of hard last minute scrambling to, to reprint and redo menus. So we've changed it um, and actually broke it off into sections like light and hoppy and dark. And that has changed the ordering uh, game immensely because usually when they walk up to the bar, they say, oh, do you have something light? And you can just point at that little category. Um, so it's, that has been really awesome to have. Um, I mean, I know like untapped and all that can, can break it apart like that, but just, it was so simple to do. Um, there was a period of time where our boiler went out, our chiller went out, um, it was like one thing after another during the summer. So we were <clears throat> kind of had this domino effect of beers uh, coming off um, out of stock. And um, Andy, the owner, uh, over the years, hates it whenever we have black tape um, over, over the menus. And so to stop that, we thought, you know, we could just edit and reprint a menu with what is actually available. But big pretty scrabble board menu has everything on it so we still have customers um you know if they don't pay attention to the new printed menu that is missing the castle pale ale and they see it on the board um it just it challenges my staff a little bit to be more vocal um but i'm okay with that rather than worrying about editing the scrabble board because that doesn't ever change um it's I don't know. I, it, I think it just goes back to your your employees being vocal and you know coming out of their shell and and just talking. Um, so those talking points and being able to pull them off of that fancy ball uh, fancy wall and look at the menu and then break it apart. But orderings become a lot faster um, when they can see those categories. So. Good tip then. Now, Tiari, you know, there's two things. First off, I have to see this Scrabble board at some point in time because it sounds awesome. That's I think we all want to see the Scrabble board. <laughs> okay. But, you know, second, on one hand, I think everybody here today has nodded their head or agreed that, you know, guests don't read. So you've got guests don't read on one side. Then on the other side, you've got high engagement from your staff to the guests. But how do you train your staff to successfully want to engage with the guests on the level <clears throat> we're all saying we should be at? Are there any secrets or what do you do on the training front to get your guests wanting to exceed your guest expectations? Just kind of throw them in there. Throw them in there. How does that work? Talk to me like, you know, if I get hired at Walking Stick, you're just throwing me behind the bar. How am I going to learn that high quality you stand for? <laughs> that was a joke. Oh, um, but I've seemingly, uh, we will train um, during some of the slower days, but then just having them in on a busy Saturday, um, they're not actually taking orders the first two weeks on the busy days because I want them to see the flow um, and just how fast paced uh, it is. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot of training. <laughs> I think training is really important, but I mean, you can't train someone on that passion and the desire to engage. Uh, you know, how do you find people who want to build those relationships versus come just sling beers for a few hours? So I could talk about that all day long. So, um, we haven't had the problem hiring folks here um, for the past five, six years. Um, we end up hiring a lot of people who know the brewery because we know that they come in all the time. Um, we have people beating down the doors to work here. Um, so the two things that I look for when I hire folks are um, customer focused attitude and how they mesh with the other staff. Um, we have a really cool environment behind the bar where everybody like genuinely gets along. We don't have, we like, it's like a no drama environment. And in my experience, that is extremely rare in F and B, um, extremely rare in front of house, especially. Um, so those two things are the things that I like for, I can teach about beer all day long. I can teach about the POS all day long. I can teach pouring technique all day long, but if you've got the customer focused attitude and you mesh with the rest of the staff, the rest is really easy. But how do you screen for that, Jim? Like when the interview process comes, so, 
it's because most of the people that we hire, probably 90% of the folks we hire, we know them really well because they come to the chat room all the time. So we know how they interact with the staff. We know how they interact with other folks that are here. So we kind of have a really good sense of it because yes, if you go on an interview, it's really easy to tell a story that may not be reflect what's actually you're all about. Um, it is occasional that we get people that um, we hire that don't really know the brewery a whole lot, but it's rare. That's really interesting, Jim, because I think so often you almost see red flags sometimes when a brewery talks about hiring their regular customers. Does anyone else here have thoughts either way on, you know, hiring people, you know? We try not to. We have a lot of regulars that, you know, your regulars love your place and they immediately think that working there is going to be the same as drinking there. So they, they don't know. But yeah, I we try not to. Um, I've had a couple of occasions where like an anniversary or whatever, if we're just getting killed, a regular will offer to like help wash glasses or something and we'll comp their tab and, and you know, let them do that. But yeah, we've we've got somebody currently who's kind of been an acquaintance of ours for years that's been affiliated with other <laughs> that we're friendly with. And I just, I don't know. I don't think that's a good idea. So, and I will, to piggyback on that, we get, like I said, people asking us all the time. So, I, and we don't really hire a lot of people because we don't have a lot of turnover. I think the last year I've hired one person. And Oh my gosh. Wow. One, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, how many people do you have employed in the tap room, Jim? Um, I have four main bartenders and we have a staff of 10 that fill in for bigger dates, Fridays and Saturdays and um, event kind of things. So we do have a kind of a core of four that work 30 to 40 hours a week and then others that work a shift or two a week. And then a couple that work like once every couple of months or just fill in whenever ships are available. Ships are available. So we don't hire a lot of people. So that does give us the advantage of being very, very selective about who we do hire. Uh, we have people that come in all the time that want to work here four or five times a week. I have someone that asks me about it. So it's not like I'm just like, Whoever says they want to work here, they work here. It's not like that at all. It's just, I mean, it's rare that you get to be behind the bar when you come in. But we do, because we know the folks, I feel like it's easier to hire someone that you just don't know anything about. Wow, that's great. Yeah, we're, we're similar to, to Jim. Um, we've got about three or four full-timers and then um, about 10 that kind of float in on the weekends. Um, and... I feel I haven't hired anyone that's, you know, just asked because, you know, they're regulars and they come here. Um, I do have a lot of friends of my bartenders that always want to work here. They're always pushing their resumes to me or stopping me whenever they're here. And I always just kind of hold off on it. Um, and it doesn't happen. I'm, I, it's flattering, um, but it's, it's a lot more than just a fun, fun bar to work at or fun brewery. So it's it is difficult, but. Just keep your foot down. <laughs> now, Tiari, while I have you, you know, there's something you mentioned in the thread we started talking about earlier today. And, you know, you comment referenced that using even the shortest encounter, like picking up an empty glass to engage with the guest and suggest they order another, can have a really big impact. How does little touches like this help create a more positive taproom experience? Or what are some other examples that you do, you know, like picking up the glass, encouraging another beer, that you use those short moments to engage? I love engaging with um, our customers. I know all of our neighbors in this area, um, but something that just happened, what's today? Um, the days all blur together, don't they? Today, uh, Friday, Friday, uh, there was a group of ladies that came in. Um, it was maybe noon and I was doing something on my laptop and this lady walked past me and she just said, um, asked if I could help her with our propane tanks because Houston gets hot and cold right now and it was kind of cold Friday, but now it's 80. Um, so she asked me and she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you work here? And I said, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll help you. So I got up, brought a propane tank to our little fire pit, turned it on and they had comments and they were just like, this place is so pretty. Um, we love the, the decor, the environment, the beer is great. And I just took that opportunity to start chatting. And I said, you know, where are you from? Where are you in town from? They were in from California in town for a wedding. They drove basically 45 minutes to come to our brewery because it was suggested to them. Um, and there's plenty of breweries in the area that they were at. Um, but I spent 
probably 10 minutes talking to them. And it was all just because I moved a propane tank uh, to their table. But like, I like to know why they're here, um, what brought them here, whether it was, you know, reviews or decor or beer, um, because we do have a really pretty brewery space. We're a little bit different than the average brewery um, in Houston, at least. And we've got fresh flowers everywhere. So to see this group of women come in, you know, not your typical looking beer drinkers, I guess. Um, those are, I don't know, I just like those one-off conversations. And we are one of the few breweries that's open seven days a week, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And I, myself and my taproom manager will help cover the bar, um, you know, during those shorter or the less busy hours between 11 and maybe one. And so those are the best times for me to be able to engage and tell people a little bit more. I can talk about this brewery all day long in my sleep. I've been here since day one, but um, I think it just gets gives more practice to anybody um, to be able to share and, you know, what they like about the space. I always tell my bartenders, you know, talk about why you like working here, um, what your favorite beers are and engage with them. It's just something so simple as, you know, did you like that beer? And um, I think I sold someone on our grapefruit IPA and I went around and I was picking up, you know, some glasses and I recognized that person. I said, Hey, what'd you think about that? She said, Oh my gosh, this, this is one of my favorite beers I've ever had. And then she ended up buying to go beers of that, but just, Re-engaging after the initial greet at the bar is something that I I enjoy and I like to push my staff to do. You know, Tiari, I mean, and everyone else here, you're all in some sort of managed position at your breweries and, you know, you all should be doing these little touches. That's how you lead by example. But going back to the training side of things, Tiari, like, what do you do to get your team to want to engage and have those brief moments like that, like you're talking about right now? Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I feel feel like we try to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with staff like individually um you know we'll sit down and have a beer and i kind of go over you know why i'm here what i want to do and asking them the same thing like are you just waiting for the next thing um so really just talking and training and bringing up the important details like it's not really about the tip or the money it's it's first and foremost the experience always um and you know, back to you never know who you're talking to. So it's a lot of talking, I guess, in my training per se. Um, and just setting those expectations and the vibe here is um, it's pretty cool um, between staff and it's, it's like family oriented along with our customers. So it's, it's easy to approach the average customer here, um, if that makes sense. So just a lot of talking. I mean, what you just said is like, you know, that guest at the end of the bar who you don't recognize could be your next best customer. And you always want to treat them the same, if, if not even greater than the regular that you recognize. Now, for everyone else, you know, is there that one little thing you do at your tap room to really engage at a higher level that you believe makes a big difference? I know it's hard to pick one little thing, but, you know, Eric, I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Our, well, we, we're inherently easy because... Um, we're not dog friendly inside, but we do have an off leash dog park and then a, a leashed patio area. So that's a really easy icebreaker. Oh, is that your dog? He's so cute. What's his name? What kind of dog is it? How, you know, so that's, that's kind of our easy in, um, is in the, our dog park is in the front. We're in a little shopping center. So as you're walking up to our building, you're walking up to the dog park. So if people have never been there before, that's an immediate icebreaker. They're like, what, what's happening out there? <laughs> Like, why are there, there's just dog chaos. There's 15 dogs running around. I love it. What's going on? So they just, you know, some people think that we're just, some group came in and they're letting their dogs run wild. And then they find out we actually planned to have a dog park. And then that's just like instantly either the coolest thing ever or they're out the door. <laughs> so It's kind of like being like on an airplane. You can always ask the person next to you, you know, where you're traveling. It's an instant yeah. conversation starter. Yeah. Now, Jim, well, you know, what do you do at Savannah River? Yeah, so I don't know that I could even ever say one thing. For me, it's a whole story. It's the whole big picture, right? It's giving people amazing customer service all the time, having great beer, events that attract a diverse crowd. I mean, honestly, that's a big thing for us. Um, the typical crap beer drinker in the past is very monolithic. Uh, people like me, um, older white dudes who just love crap beer, and we're so much more than that. You know, We want to sell beer to everyone. Um, so we have events that attract 
everybody who could possibly come to the brewery, bike nights and uh, drag brunches and trivia and bands and all the things, all the things all the time. Um, so getting people in the door, getting like everyone in the door and then giving everybody that great treatment. It's not just, you know, paying attention to our regulars. It's seeking those folks out. Um, you know, occasionally people come in with a book and they want to be left alone and read, but I feel like everybody wants to be engaged. Um, we don't have bussers or dishwashers. Um, we all take breaks and our breaks are like walking around and bussing tables, but taking those moments to have a conversation about people. The same thing that uh, Tara was talking about. Do you like that beer? Can we cut your dog? That kind of thing. Just engaging everybody that comes in all the time. Love it. Casey and Nick, anything to add to this one? Um, I've had a lot of people um, that have really even like, so with Square and probably most POSs that everyone uses, there's a feedback option if you get an email or a text receipt or something like that. And we've had a lot of people um, leave comments saying, like, oh, I come here once every month and staff still recognizes me and they know that the really malty Scottish style beer is going to be coming out next week. And for some reason, they remembered that I really liked that. And so when I walked through the door and walked up to the bar, they uh, said, hey, next week we've got a Scotch ale coming out. Uh, you may want to come back in next week instead of waiting like a month or something like that. And it was really nice to hear that from somebody, just that my staff was actually thinking of a guest who's not really here all that often. I don't think they live in town at all. Um, and then there's a couple other things that I really like to do. We've, we're very heavy on our social media marketing, but we don't do email or anything like that. And we don't really have like a release calendar on our website because the beer's for us, the beer's ready when it's ready. And so like this past weekend, we had a barrel aged stout bottle release and in year or in releases past, we've done online orders for it. But this one, we were just like, we'll do it in person, get it in, get it out. And I've got like five, six people that don't use social media that get really, really irate when we don't tell them somehow that this beer that they feel like they should be getting their hands on too uh, is coming out. So I've got a small email list of non-social media users that I just like have it set up in Gmail and I'm like, oh, well, we're waxing bottles today. I am just going to reach out to these six people and then they come in the next day, like right at noon. They're like, Thank you so much because I wasn't going to come down here today. I don't come out on Fridays. It's too busy. So it's just, it's nice to let people know that you're thinking about them, even if maybe they don't come in that often. Yeah, going above and beyond. Absolutely. Casey, is there any little thing you do at Four Noses and your other tap rooms that, you know, really helps take the experience to the next level and go above and beyond? Yeah, I feel like everyone's mentioned all the good things. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't want to um, beat a dead horse here. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of little things and uh, friendly, smiling faces go a long way. Uh, things like, I think, some things like mug clubs or whatever that means for your brewery. Um, a really cool way to acknowledge your regular. So one of ours, they get their own <clears throat> kind of granite uh, coaster with their name on it. Uh, and that's rather than their own mug, since they serve a lot of beers and check mugs. Um, but the, uh, and that's a pretty cool thing. It makes people, your best regulars connected you and they're gonna bring in their friends and family and they're gonna be hardcore fans. They're kind of invested a little bit. And so, um, but no, everyone's done a, what everyone else said, yeah. Yeah, they, they took all the good ideas. So, you know, one thing I want to dive back into, Jim, and you had touched on this a little while ago. You know, I preach that higher engagement, it leads to higher tips. You you want to always go for that high level of engagement. And, you know, my, my secret hopper data shows that guests tip an average of 27% on visits when they receive a high level of engagement from mm -hmm. the staff. And Jim, on the thread, you commented that in 2023, your staff's average tip is 25.2, like literally demonstrating near high level of engagement all the time. You know, of course, there's some visits where you're not able to give that exceptionally high level of engagement. That's amazing, Jim, that you're seeing such a high level of engagement. So, you know, you've already talked about how you have amazing retention in your tap room because of all the, you know, the culture you've created. But for everybody here, and Jim, we can start with you again. You know, what are some of the benefits you see from getting your same get your guest, your, your staff on the same page as you, you know, engaging at a high level and just really teaching your guests what to expect? What are some of the benefits you all experience in your breweries? I mean, so no doubt about it, you know, the tips are a big thing, but I've got a staff that's not like super 
money focused. I feel like um, they just generally like talking to people. Um, they love coming to work. They, I mean, you can pour beer all day long. Pouring beer is an easy thing to do, but you, it, when you find those folks that really genuinely like getting to know people, not just like on a very artificial level, um, knowing them when they come in, like you uh, talking about, like those folks come in once a month and really knowing them and giving those folks a reason to come back. Um, it's just, you know, modeling good behavior when you have a whole staff that's doing it and you have a new person that does come on, they see everybody doing that and it becomes a natural thing. You know, it's kind of like a hive mentality sort of thing. And it's weird to say that, but it's really like that. You know, you just kind of create this culture and that's what the expectation is. And it makes it, you know, kind of easy day to day to do the job and to not have to worry about managing the employees a whole lot because they just do it. No, I love that. Anyone else, you know, any benefits you see from, you know, exceeding these taproom guest expectations? One thing uh, my staff does really well, um, and we're, again, we're out in the suburbs, so we do get new people in all the time that are just finding us, but a lot of our crowd are people from the neighborhood. We have people that are there every day. We've got people that are there a couple times a week or once a week, but the more my staff gets to know them, um, the more they know kind of their limits. We had a, a guest who's one of our guys who's there every day um, overdo it recently. And we kind of talked about it as a group. And, and I, I learned some things about this guest that I felt I knew pretty well. I've served him beers, but I'm not always his only server. And I do have staff that are in that position where they're like, yeah, I've served Justin several beers today, but his limit is like five in this set time. So they know people's limits. They know their personalities enough to where they can tell if something's off or they can tell this person's having a bad day. They just slammed two beers. I know that four is their limit and they probably should chill out for a little bit before they have that third beer. So that's a huge benefit for us because every single time we've had to cut off a regular, it's come back, you know, the next day, like, Hey guys, I'm sorry. Thank you. I hope I didn't get too crazy. Thank you for making sure I got home safe. I was, you know, whatever life event happened that brought them in to drink that heavily, you know, they weren't watching out for their best interest, but my staff was because my staff knows them, they care about them. And people know that people can tell if you're just smiling to be nice to get a tip um, or if you're genuinely having a conversation and you're participating in that, or even with a new guest, if you've created some kind of an inside joke or made some kind of a comment on that first interaction that you can bring up later for a little callback. People love that. It's like, it's like the instance of, you know, not, not having seen that person in a month and then remembering what they like it people that resonates so strongly with people. And I feel like my staff are all very good at finding that common ground with everybody or finding that little thing that they click with somebody and then the next time that person comes in and they see that staff member is working they're like that's my guy i can't wait you know so it's that's a huge benefit you know in in keeping people safe and keeping them come back to an environment that they know cares about them that's a huge that's a fantastic benefit. example erica mm -hmm. no i love that agree does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that one or just, you know, a general benefit you see from creating clear expectations and your staff getting behind them. So one thing I would like to talk about today is, you know, we cannot quantify, you know, the value of a human relationship. Like what Erica, what you just described is unbelievable. And I think that's why we all go to tap rooms. We want to build those connections with people. And, you know, one benefit of those connections is we can keep people safer, which is amazing that you can do that just by, you know, knowing them. And I, I love those personal connections. But what types of data do you all use to measure the success, you know, of your tap room, whether it's, you know, the size of your tabs, the tip percentage, you know, are there any metrics that you really enjoy to judge the success of a visit? I just think every interaction is different. You know, people are so different and there's so many variables. It's hard to kind of quantify every visit down to one set of kind of parameters that you're going to judge it on. But, you know, so we have like trivia tonight. We have teams that come every week and they have fun no matter what. I've got a team of grumpy old people that aren't going to have fun no matter what. So it's going to be, you know, like they, they still come back, though, and they still buy beers and there's eight of them. So, like, yeah, they're they're never happy, but they still come back. So I feel like that's a win. They're not going to be happy no matter what. We've learned that about them. They're they're Yeah, they're just. 
those people. So I think you said it, you know, repeat customers are a sign you're doing something right. Right. Yeah. We have, you know, I think one thing that's useful is talking to customers and, um, sorry, Jim. Um, no, but, don't uh, your mind. <laughs> the, um, you know, when we have our annual mug club and talking to those that, that didn't renew, you know, sometimes it's something pretty obvious. They're moving to Texas or something like that. Uh, but sometimes they, you know, they're like, ah, you know, we just aren't coming back. Well, why is that? What was the reason why you were this diehard fan and you haven't been coming back as frequently? Um, and so I think just having those conversations, you might even have a regular whose phone number you have, you can reach out to. Um, and then beyond that, watching, watching Google reviews and just trying to get all that honest guest feedback. If we've had, you know, we like to think we hire and train good people, but we have had bartenders that were uh, less than friendly in certain situations. So that's something they, you need to know about to address uh, in the moment because uh, we like to all think we're good judges of character, but every now and then someone someone sneaks past you. So um, no one who uh, be able to prevent, catch it, prevent it, and address it uh, is always really important too. But. <clears throat> I think scary, Jim. Yeah, I was going to say I, we could probably do a better job about looking at like kind of micro financial data, tab sizes, that kind of thing. I don't pay hardly any attention to that at all. I do look at, you know, overall sales numbers, uh, month, so February this year to February last year, uh, all Tuesdays in general to see how we're doing. Uh, but it's repeat customers. I mean, one of the metrics that it's this very soft metric, but we do have a mug club. Uh, we limit it to 200 every year and it sells out earlier every year. And we always get folks coming out after it's sold out, just crushed that they, for whatever reason, didn't know about it in time or whatever. Uh, but it's it's the little things, honestly, that tell us that we're doing a good job. Obviously, sales are super important, but I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to like micro financial stuff. Um, I do pay attention to what beers are selling, what beers aren't selling, but that's more of a back of house concern than a front of house concern. I feel like. I mean, the experience is so important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with um, with them on that. Like numbers are great and all, but you can always just know whenever you either pull up the cameras or you're in your tap room and you see the same people coming back something that i love is um one of my employees so we have half off wine night on wednesday nights and uh, we also give away our flowers on wednesday nights it's the whole deal um so <laughs> with that um one of my bartenders madison has totally just owned that night and that is her shift and she has a whole crew of regulars that come in they love to see her. Um, another thing that I love doing or giving my staff ownership of is the music. Um, and all of our regulars know that. So depending on who's working, everybody has like a different style and genre that they have um, set. And I remember the first time I asked staff, I said, hey, you know, if you've got a playlist you want to play, put it on and that'll be during your shift. So they all kind of made it like a competition to a point to where um, the most customers that would come up and say like, Who's, whose playlist is this? What is this? Um, it was just kind of a fun internal thing that they do. Um, but now everyone knows who listens to what. So I've got Amy opening right now and she's big on country. Um, so it's not the not the 50s country. It's it's pretty modern and, you know, welcoming. But then I've got another bartender that loves a little bit of reggae, a little more chill. And I've got another one. But you just know who's working based on their playlist. And those guests come for that also um, between the bartenders, the beer, the experience and the music. So it's it's been interesting to see um, this subtle little following that happens just on music. We Wait, do that, that too, and we have guests that have playlists too. So we right. have we have a guest who's a mortgage broker guy, so he usually works from the tap room, so he's there for hours a day. So we'll put his playlist on when he's in the house, and other guests are like, "Oh, is this Derek's playlist? Did he add stuff?" <laughs> but isn't that the best though? Everybody, you know, when a guest leaves your tap room, saying, "Oh my gosh, Erica was the best. Jim was amazing," and then they come back just because Tiari's playing her music, like that's what these human relationships are all about when we come to tap rooms. I love I steal that. their playlist. <laughs> you just take all the best songs and put it on like your compilation. Pretty much. Cause I don't know what's out there anymore. <laughs> I was I the funniest comments we ever got was, um, Haley is our uh, Monday opener and she's a two thousands kid and she plays nineties punk pop, 
punk pop all the time. And one of the funniest reviews we ever got was the beer was great, the staff was great, but that 90s pop punk was terrible and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> so I guess. And then there's that that happens sometimes, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, then you just come on someone else's shift, you get a little bit better. Sure. Music. Yeah. And you just didn't know. Yeah. I love it. Now, one takeaway I also had from this fun thread where we we're kind of rediscussing today was. You know, Nick, it was Anthony at your brewery. He gave a book recommendation. He recommended the book Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Guidara. He was the former over owner of a fancy restaurant in New York City called 11 Madison Park. And his whole philosophy was all the best restaurants in the world at the time he opened his restaurant were known for making amazing meals. People left saying that meal was amazing. But he wanted to not only make, you know, fantastic meals that people bragged about, but also have people leave and saying the hospitality was world class. It's the best I've ever experienced. And that sounds like the goal that all of you have today. Is that correct? Yeah. 100%. I love it. So like, you know, rapid fire right now for everyone listening, I think everybody's really in the, aiming to build these expectations, setting these guest expectations and creating memorable experiences. What's one thing all of you feel that other breweries should do right now or some secret sauce that you can give to, you know, just better deepen relationship with guests. Is there anything you'd like to, you know, end today with? Have conversations. Say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> yeah, have conversations with everybody, make friends with everybody, look for those opportunities all the time. I was just going to say kind of that, um, know your demographic. And for us, that's hard because we've got a changing neighborhood. But, you know, just train your staff to read people a little bit, have a conversation. Some people just want to get in and order a beer and they don't want to talk. Um, you know, some people are sitting at the bar because they want to engage. So, like, look at body language. Know, know who you're serving and try to kind of cater the experience to that person to do the best of your ability. Awesome. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I feel like... Um, Everyone always focuses on engaging with the customers, but I think a good takeaway would be to re-engage um, all the time. <laughs> um, so re-engaging with repeat customers, with you know someone that just comes up to the bar and orders, and you know going back, touching the table, and picking up glasses, re-engaging. Um, I think re-engaging would be my word. <laughs> I like it. I'm gonna go a little different and say go to other breweries. Um, Go to other tap rooms, and especially the ones around you, and figure out why do those customers come here today? You know, maybe they also go to my brewery. Maybe they never come to my brewery. And you might even overhear what some of them think about your brewery. But uh, at the very least, you can get some ideas, some inspiration, and figure out what you love about other tap rooms. And you can, you can borrow it. You can uh, make it your own and uh, get re-inspired. I think we often get too close to our own space and forget um, what all cool things there are out there. Oh, Casey, I love that so much. I love going to a tap room for the first time and just experiencing every little thing that you just mentioned and seeing what you love about it, what you don't like about it, and what you can just pass along to someone else. And last but not least, Nick, you get to close us out. Uh, well, one thing I like to do that I encourage my staff to do is, like, if you're coming in on your day off for a beer with your partner or some friends, invite people over to your table. I mean... A lot of places have really long, like eight, 10, 12 person tables for a reason. It's for people to feel communal and everything like that. So it's like, it's nice to come in on a Sunday afternoon when that's my day off and I'll just sit down at the bar or at one of the long tables and people will just come up and sit down and talk to me like, oh, how was your week? Any weird stories about customers that while well, I was gone this weekend or something like that. And it's just nice to really have customers want to engage you outside of when you're on your shift like i've got uh, one of my bartenders is also off on sundays he uh he'll he'll come in and sit down and just read a book and then if like he's gotten people to hang out with him for like six hours mm -hmm. i don't want to hang out here for six hours on my day <laughs> off but that's everybody's cup of, well, it's his cup of tea i guess like but he's had just people will come up to his table they'll just sit down they'll drink they'll talk they'll do everything it's really wholesome to see something like that happen organically awesome well nick thanks for sharing that and nick tiari casey jim and erica thank you so much for being here today this is a topic i love talking about so much and i really appreciate all of you sharing your insight how we can blow the guest's mind so thank you again and everybody have an awesome yeah. day we'll see you soon thank you, thank you. Cool. Thank you. bye Thanks, guys.